morning. Welcome to oral argument session here at the 5th DCA. I've been introduced. Let me briefly introduce the other members of the panel this morning. To my right and your left is Judge Rand Wallace from Orange County and to my left is Judge Jamie Grosshands also from Orange County. We've got three cases on the docket today. <coughs> Excuse me. It'll be 20 minutes per side for the appellant. We're going to the default setting for rebuttal time if you want that will be five minutes. If you want anything more or less than that, just let me know. And finally, if any of you have any electronic devices, please turn those off at this time so that the arguments are not interrupted. I'm going to go ahead and call the first case up at this time, case 18-1905, the estate of Gregory Dean Smith versus Mary Smith. Appellant, whenever you are ready, you may proceed. My name is Robert Bailey. I represent the appellant, Erica Jill Negley, who is the personal representative of the estate of Gregory Smith, her father. This is an appeal that has been taken from a non-jury trial conducted on December 8 of 2017 in the probate division of the Circuit Court of Volusia County for an evidentiary hearing upon statements of claim, three statements of claim filed by Mary Smith and the objections to those claims made by the personal representative. The claims consist of um, claims for funeral expense recovery, recovery of medical expenses, and recovery of real estate expenses related to property that had been jointly held between Mary Smith and the decedent Greg Smith. I'd like to provide a brief factual background and then discuss the evidence. The claimant, Mary Smith, met Greg Smith in 1994. They began to cohabit in 1996 and lived together uh, until his death in August of 2013. They were never married, but the claimant changed her last name to Smith and it was their intention to live as husband and wife for all outward purposes. They maintained joint bank accounts, had no separate bank accounts in their names, and over the course of their relationship, they acquired eight properties, some of which were rental properties and the other were vacant land. And uh, <clears throat> in November of 2012, Greg Smith fell into a diabetic coma from which he did not recover. He, on December 22nd, he was admitted into University East Rehab in Deland. The admission involved the claimant um, signing admission paperwork which included a payor agreement. The nature of the payor agreement was to obligate the claimant to use her legal access to any funds belonging to Greg Smith in order to pay for the services rendered. Thereafter, Greg Smith died in, at University Health uh, East on August 6th of 2013. <clears throat> Following his death, there was a funeral arranged which was um, between the children and the claimant. And the Counsel, claimant- I'm gonna interrupt you there. When they made the funeral arrangements, were they all together? Yes, Your Honor. And at any point, did the children voice any objections or concerns about the cost of the funeral or anything at that point? Not that I'm aware of, Your Honor. Is there any claim at all that any of the expenses are unreasonable for the funeral? Um, no, sir. No, Your yeah, Honor. Obviously, there, were, there was an issue, I believe, with her name being put on the monument, um, but any, any, anything other than that? Um, no, Your Honor. Not in regards to the funeral services. There, was, there are three documents associated with the funeral claim. The first document is related to the purchase of mausoleum space by the couple in the year 2000, long before the events of his death and funeral occurred. Um, that was submitted as part of her claim. The other parts of the claim were for a contract for purchase of funeral expense services and then a separate contract for internment or burial services. 
The third contract for internment and burial services reflects upon it a printed notation that reads, to be paid by insurance proceeds. Otherwise, there was no evidence introduced in regards to the funeral uh, recovery issue that would establish that there was, in fact, um, an assignment of life insurance benefits which were to be used to pay for the funeral expense that had been arranged. The life insurance... Is it um, your position that those funeral expenses were never paid? There's, there was just no evidence introduced at trial as to the payment of the expense. Well, wasn't, there to yeah, it? wasn't there testimony to that effect? She, the claimant testified that she had assigned the ins that she had made an assignment of insurance benefits. She did not testify as to what payment was made by the insurance company, when it was made, or in what fashion. It was just a matter that she testified she had assigned the insurance proceeds. Is there any evidence that those expenses are outstanding? No, sir. There's been no evidence produced either way. There was no discovery conducted by either party as to the funeral home, but on the witness list presented by the claimant, she had a representative of the funeral home listed, uh, but that person did not testify. Any evidence of a lien by the funeral home as far as any outstanding unpaid balances? There was no, um, no attempt by the funeral home to enter into the estate process directly or otherwise file a claim. Um, there was no information received from the funeral home or any representative of the funeral home. The nature of the claimant's assertion was that she had assigned insurance benefits. Therefore, the law of assignment in Florida would seem to be applicable to the claimant's actions. And because there was no introduction to evidence of the actual assignment, if one was executed, then the law of Florida appears clear that this would be an unqualified assignment. And the, as an unqualified assignment, it acts to transfer all right, title, and interest in into the in this case, insurance proceeds, or the thing that was assigned, um, and therefore, including any incidental rights associated with the insurance proceeds, it is our contention that those incidental rights include the uh, right to seek a reimbursement from, for the funeral expense, and that that right would have transferred to the insurance company at the time that they took over responsibility to pay for the funeral expense. Certainly, the claimant could have approached, during the time that this case was at issue, the claimant could have approached the insurance company and had adequate opportunity to try and acquire a, a written document or some evidence that she retained the right to seek a, a recovery of the funeral expense. But again, there was no evidence to support that conclusion. So one of the issues that we have is we believe there was a lack of uh, competent substantial evidence as to the actual amount, if any, that was paid to the funeral home. And the other is that we believe that the claimant had, re had removed her right to seek reimbursement of this uh, funds based on the assignment and the fact that it was unqualified. So that is our, as to that portion of the trial court's ruling, we have sought an appeal and would request that the uh, recovery of funeral expense be denied based upon the failure to provide competent substantial evidence of the actual amount of the payment and further to <clears throat> no evidence was presented that the assignment was qualified and, re and that reserved to the claimant the right to pursue a claim for those insurance proceeds. The other issue presented on appeal is the recovery of medical expense. This is a more interesting part of the case. Um, what happened is this, after the death of Greg Smith and after the funeral had been conducted, University East Rehab sued the claimant under the payor agreement, alleging that she had breached her obligations under the agreement by failing to uh, use the, dec the decedent's assets to pay for his services. During the course of the litigation, the plaintiff testified that she discovered for the first time that she did not own the eight pieces of real estate as their surviving joint tenant, and that half of the interest in five of the properties would descend to the decedent's children, a son and daughter, the daughter being the personal representative now of his estate. 
upon determining that that was the circumstance, even though she had grounds to avoid liability under the payor agreement and had defenses to the claim of University East, the claimant chose to pursue a settlement with University East under which she would acquire an assignment of all rights from University East as to the medical services rendered to the decedent. Do you, is your claim that she's not entitled to any medical expenses, or do you think there was competent substantial evidence as to at least the 15000 plus attorney's fees? There is evidence that she acquired the, the um, assignment of the claim from universities for $15,000 as a result of a mediated settlement. And, and, uh, but the claim that the, was registered by the claimant in the probate was a claim for over $50,000. And that is the claim that we were addressing and addressed through trial. Um, so as far as was there evidence of the actual 15000 being paid, no, but it was not an issue that was really addressed either way other than it was asserted that that was how she came to have an opportunity to make the claim. Again, in this instance, we have an argument that there was no competent substantial evidence um, to support the recovery of medical expenses to the extent that the court appears to have relied upon a document that was not introduced into evidence during the trial and uh, in, in making the award of the funeral expense recovery, the court awarded $43,977, which is the amount stated in the complaint that University East sued the claimant for. Um, the court indicates that we relied upon an exhibit attached to the complaint which um, was again not introduced into evidence, but it's clear from the court's ruling that the court determined based on its own review of that document that um, a recovery in that amount was awardable to the claimant. The court did not address in its order an affirmative defense that had been pled to the effect that the claimant was acting at the time that she uh, gained admission into the University East for, the, for Greg Smith, she was acting as his agent and was in a fiduciary position having been a longtime trusted life companion of the decedent. Based upon that, that characterization of her relationship, the, the claimant or plaintiff would have been unable to then use her knowledge of his admission to gain an assignment of the medical expense and then pursue that against his estate. Her motivation was that she had discovered that she did not own all of the real estate as her surviving joint tenant. And therefore, it was her intention to create three claims and pursue those claims against the probate of his estate in hopes that she would recover the real estate ultimately. Do we have anything that shows us what was presented to the trial court regarding this claim? There's Pres nothing in the record because it was not ad admitted into evidence. So I am familiar with the document. Other than the companionship, what evidence was there that would, that would establish um, the agency relationship between the decedent and Mrs. Smith? Well. Um, they had, again, shared their incomes in, a, in joint bank accounts for the entire time of their relationship, is my understanding. They had purchased these properties together um, and had managed them together as jointly held assets. When he became incapacitated... And obviously the ownership of the property became, uh, I mean, she discovered afterwards that it wasn't as she had thought, so... Well, Yes, sir. That, that would not, in my opinion, I guess maybe you would disagree, um, be a finding that would be strong in your favor as far as finding of an agency relationship or... Um, it was her act... may call into question the actual um, companionship relationship as well, or at least, you know, dull that a little bit, you would agree? The testimony of the claimant was that these were, she considered these to be mistakes and the deeds and that she regarded this as her property. 
um, but that, of course, she recognized because she was in the real estate business that there was a problem with the title to the property. And those and, documents were properly recorded, is that correct? Yes, they were. Okay, without her name? No, her name was on the documents. Okay. They, just re they did not refer to them as joint tenants with right of survivorship. They created a tenancy in common as to five of the eight properties. The other three were joint tenants with right of survivorship. So it's the, the tenancy in common properties that were the subject of the, of the claim. That's what we have as estate assets, is the half interest. <clears throat> and again, it's the claimant's actions in admitting the decedent who was incapacitated in a diabetic coma and who never recovered consciousness until his death. It was her actions that arranged for uh, the medical services to be provided by University East. She was acting as his agent at that time, it is our contention. And the nature of the payor agreement, by its very wording, requires that she be a person who presents herself as having legal access to the decedent's ass in this case, the, the patient's or resident's assets, and, and that's what she did, was, you know, sign the payor agreement. However, she never made any payments to University East in, re in response to the agreement, and upon his death, they took it upon themselves to sue her under the payor agreement. Um, it's her actions in establishing the medical expense as his agent that we believe precludes her from now attempting to acquire an adverse interest to the claimant. It's clear her interest was to create claims that would allow her to attempt to recover the other half of the real estate that she felt belonged to her. And therefore, it appears that she has taken a position adverse to the principal, if you would, being the resident or the decedent, and um, because he had died long before this discovery was made and before she attempted to get the assignment. But the law of agency indicates that once there is trust reposed in a fiduciary relationship, that that relationship does not terminate in, in regards to the matters that were within the scope of the fiduciary relationship. And here that would be the medical expense incurred at University East Rehab. You're, you're into your rebuttal time, just so you know. Okay, I'm sorry, I meant to just say I only wanted to reserve about two minutes. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, so the law seems clear and fundamental in the law of agency is the principle that the agent cannot use knowledge acquired during the scope of the agency to then take a position adverse to that of the principle. We believe that's exactly what this uh, action by the claimant illustrates is an attempt to use uh, the ability to be aware of the situation, to manage to acquire an assignment, and then to pursue the estate for um, actually amounts in excess of the assignment, you know, to the tune of over $50,000. If there had been a claim for $15,000, it would have been a lot easier to understand why the estate would have an interest in um, trying to resolve that claim by payment. But when the claim was presented, it was presented as a health care provider attempting to collect medical services, not as someone who was attempting to protect the estate. However, the testimony of the plaintiff was that that was her intention, to protect the estate from litigation with the University East, which, of course, the estate was subjected to litigation. She waited almost two years from the date of death, just before the time would conclude for creditors' claims, and then attempted to petition for the administration of his estate. It was at that time that his children first learned that they had a half interest in the property, and, that it, and that's when um, objections were raised as to these claims, was during the course of this, the estate that she attempted to start. Um, therefore, we believe that the law precludes recovery of medical expense as to the claimant, the plaintiff. Anyone else perhaps could have acquired an assignment of University East claim and pursued it, um, but not her because she was instrumentally involved in creating the expense to begin with on his behalf for in his best interest so that he could have care. Um, and, and we think that that prevents and precludes under the law her ability to um, make that recovery and the trial court erred in failing to address 
this affirmative defense in its ruling. That's all the time I have. Okay, thank you. Ferguson representing Mary Smith. Shall I proceed? You may proceed. Okay, the, the issues that we have here today are, um, you know, first involving the funeral payment. You know, it's our position that there was uh, sufficient uh, evidence presented uh, that Mary Smith caused the funeral expenses to be paid out of the money she had coming to her from an insurance company. And there was no assignment of the, you know, the, there was no assignment here that affects any situation between the parties in that, I mean, perhaps she assigned it as the insurance company is involved and that she could not claim that money back against the insurance company, but her using her insurance proceeds to pay the funeral claims is just like selecting a method of payment, credit card, checking account, or the insurance money that was coming her way. And there was sufficient evidence in that the amounts that were awarded by the judge are shown in the documents that were, you know, presented into evidence, the, the funeral company's documents, as well as Mary Smith's testimony that that was in fact paid. And I don't think there's any real dispute as to the amount or that payment. So it's pretty clear, I believe, that Mary Smith is entitled to recovery of the funeral expenses pursuant to the judge's order. The next issue was the issue of the, um, medical expenses. And counsel, I'm going to interrupt you on this one. Can you point us um, exactly where in the record that the document reviewed by the judge, the transaction history from, I think, university, mm -hmm. um, was admitted into evidence during the hearing? The, my recollection is that all of the documents were uh, submitted to the court as a composite exhibit of, you know, the, uh, the uh, pay But is it in agreement. the record? I believe that it was, I don't know that the document itself is in the record, though it was produced at trial and it was discussed at trial. It was also part of the complaint. It was an exhibit to the comp university's complaint against Mary Smith and it was listed on both parties' exhibit lists as um, a, um, you know, as an exhibit to be used at trial in that it, um, you know, was attached to that complaint. How it got removed from that complaint when the clerk placed into evidence pretty much everything, but the transaction history does not I don't think that uh, disallows the judge from considering the testimony about it. Uh, Mary Smith testified as to, you know, these documents. And also the amount sought is in the complaint. Um, the complaint itself says that University East is seeking $43,000 um, for their claim. Mary steps into that. Uh, position when she um, receives the assignment and um, so she comes So you agree if university was bringing this claim and they came in and said our complaint says we want 45,000 mm -hmm. and we're gonna testify you owe us 45,000 that that would not be enough I, I'm sorry say that under just a, a normal case if you have the complaint that says the amount owed and you have someone testifying, you know, as a 
you know, representative of the hospital, I think they owe $45,000. That's what we've said they owe. Would that be enough for the judge to award $45,000? If there's no uh, testimony to rebut the testimony that that's the amount that was, that was owed, I think at this point the burden somewhat shifts to the appellant when there's a you know, testimony that this was the amount of the claim and it's in the complaint and all claims against the estate are transferred to Mary, I think she made the prima facie case whether the transaction history is part of the record or whether it was, um, it was discussed and the court was aware of it um, and no one objected to the court reviewing it at the time we were in trial and that- But we would, don't have a record of that. Well, there wasn't a court reporter. And, um, but the, with her testimony and the fact that it was admitted that amount through the, um, the, the complaint itself, I believe that then the appellant had the duty to say, hang on, prove these expenses. And there was no such showing. There was never a objection to the amount of those expenses. So you're relying on the fact that they were included in the complaint? It was concluded in the complaint. The parties, uh, Mary Smith testified about it and the court reviewed that document. Did the estate admit that allegation in their answer to the complaint? I beg your pardon? Did the estate admit that allegation when they answered the complaint? Admit the... The allegation that $43,000 is owed. Did the estate admit that? They file an answer to the complaint. In that answer, did they concede that that's the amount that's owed? I have to look at the... Um, Otherwise, I'd what, what difference does it make that it was included in the complaint? What ev that's not evidence. It's because you, you've alleged it, right? Well, it's not evidence, but it's been alleged, and it's been uh, alleged as the basis of universities' um, claim against... If university had the claim against the estate, they could come in and they could testify that we spent forty-three thousand dollars, and um, you know show up, you know, with with that amount. And then I think the burden shifts to the other side to determine that the damages are not the correct amount of damages. I think at some point that needed to be raised. That you know we've we've testified that university. Or we've presented testimony through Mary in the complaint and the other documents that this is the correct amount uh, to be reimbursed to university. And then I think it shifts to the other side to say, hang on, that those aren't true and clear and correct charges. So, um, and once again, you know, we believe that there was sufficient evidence. There were no objections, you know, to the amounts at trial. Um, the, and then the, you know, as far as the being barred by a fiduciary relationship, I don't think there was any showing in the, you know, no evidence of the fiduciary relationship other than they, lived together for a prolonged period of time. I don't think that that establishes any defense to, you know, the uh, medical claim either. So on these purposes, I believe that the trial court was correct. Part of what she paid included about $8,000 roughly in attorney's fees, right? Yes. And, and that's money that she has sought reimbursement for. Yes. I don't believe the court awarded the $8,000 in attorney's fees. Um, the, on the fees for defending the university claim? Yes, sir. Yeah, she sought those, they were not awarded. Yeah. I mean, testimony was she spent $15,000 to settle the claim, to protect the estate from further litigation from the um, university hospital, as well as other creditors, and things took off from there. Okay. And 
for those reasons, I believe that the court was correct and should be with that, upheld. All right, thank you. Yes, sir, counsel, you've got just under two minutes. Um, the record is clear that the transaction history was not ad admitted into evidence. Um, it, was, that by, was that an oversight that it wasn't admitted? Uh, apparently. Or was it intentional? There was, there was some agreement that we're going to leave this out? Because there was Exhibit oh, there, C to the complaint. There was no agreement um, that we would leave it out or it was just a matter that it was not admitted into evidence. That what was admitted into evidence was a document demonstrating the complaint, the answer to the complaint, the uh, assignment, the mediated settlement agreement, um, and one other document. Uh, there were exhibits attached to the complaint that were admitted along with the complaint. It was admitted through the plaintiff's testimony. It was admitted through her counsel. Um, I was aware that the document had not been entered into evidence and advised the court that there had been no evidence presented to an authenticating witness as to the medical expenses. And the court was aware, you know, of our position in regards to the medical expense issue and that it would require, because it was a hearsay document by its very nature, a document that had been, been produced presumably by University East and attached to a complaint filed by one of their attorneys, there was no other evidence in respect to the document. All the plaintiff could testify to is that she was served with the document. She was familiar with the time in which Greg Smith was at University East between his admission and his death. But there was no attempt made to review the document, which is a 10-page document, and uh, quite extensive. It refers, I'm not sure I'm allowed to talk about that. And my time is up. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you,